Super Metroid is one of the greatest games ever made. Yeah, I'm going in hot on this one, you can't stop me. But there's really no point in trying to beat around the bush here, everyone and their mother knows how good this game is. Metroid 1 and 2 were both games that had good ideas that were limited by the hardware they were on. Super Metroid has no such limitations, and it uses the power of the Super Nintendo to its fullest potential. The gameplay, graphics, sound, map design, world building, atmosphere, it's all some of the best that the console has to offer. Powerful hardware isn't all it's needed to make a great game, however. Fortunately, Super Metroid transcends the system that it's on. It's still relevant in the current day in the topics of game design, speedrunning, and just overall being a fun game to play, with some people still considering it to be the peak of the series. Which, I mean, isn't necessarily wrong, but you read that title. Almost perfect. I just sung this game's praises without even taking it out to dinner yet, but just know that there is a reason that I put that almost there. Me personally, Super Metroid isn't my favorite game in the 2D series, but it's a very close second. I have absolutely no problem with people that think it is the best game, I can totally see why. But for me, I think I'm always going to prefer Zero Mission. There's a few key things that I think Zero Mission manages to do slightly better than Super, but I'll save those thoughts for later. Right now, just know that Super Metroid kicks ass and deserves pretty much all the praise that it gets. Is there anything actually wrong with Super Metroid, or am I just a nitpicky little bitch? Is this really the best that the series has to offer? In that case, does it only go downhill from here? Let's take a deeper look into Super Metroid and see if we can answer those questions. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. With the power of the Super Nintendo, the game opens up with a cinematic cutscene. The uncanny, digitized voice, a first-person retelling of the previous two games, and animated shots redone in the style of Super Metroid's graphics, it's all just... iconic. After the events of the second game, where Samus takes in a baby Metroid, which is the last of its species, she delivers it to a team of researchers on board Space Colony Ceres. The team experiments with the Metroid, and discovers that its powers can be used for the good of civilization. Satisfied with their work, Samus leaves Ceres in search of a new bounty to hunt, but she doesn't make it far before learning that the space pirates have attacked the station in her absence. She speeds back to investigate, kicking off the game proper. I'd say this intro is very well done overall. Especially after playing the first two games, it does a really effective job setting the stage and getting the player invested in the world and the story. I'm not sure if it would hook a first time player quite the same way, but I'd argue that it doesn't really need to since the story takes a bit of a backseat from here on out. With that being said, there's no way to skip this cutscene if you don't really care about what's going on. I hate it when games do this, and it's really no different here. It makes the first few minutes replaying the game a bit of a slog when you already know exactly what's going to happen. The intro sequence isn't quite done yet though, we get a bit of an interactive section here. Samus explores a station, desolate with no signs of life, before coming across the baby Metroid. But it's not alone. How did Ridley come back to life after the first game? I don't know, probably the same reason he's like four times bigger than he was before, but it doesn't matter. Samus is outmatched by her nemesis, and Ridley escapes with the Metroid in tow. The station is rigged to explode, and Samus only has a minute to escape. I am assuming to make up for the lack of an escape sequence in Metroid 2. Not deterred by her defeat, Samus immediately tracks the space pirates back to their base on planet Zebus, rebuilt after it was destroyed in Metroid 1, and begins her hunt for the last Metroid. The surface of Zebus is dark and dilapidated, with a thunderstorm rolling over. Upon first arrival, there are no signs of life to be seen anywhere, even deeper into the caves of Criteria. Okay, it wasn't enough that this pit was all copy-pasted in Metroid 1, but now they just had to copy-paste it in this game too? Yeah, here the game takes you through the old PTSD chamber, and by that I mean Turian, to show that yes, you are indeed on the same planet Zebus. There's even an elevator here that takes you back to the very first room of the original game, and you'll need to come here to get the Morph Ball right in the same place it was the first time around. Well, so much for this place being abandoned. After getting some missiles, Samus returns to Torian and is vastly outnumbered by the space pirate forces. This marks their first physical appearances in an actual game, instead of just being an afterthought in the game's manual. They kind of look like... grey lobsters, and they have the ability to shoot crinkle-cut french fries. This is the main antagonistic faction of the entire series, and they're so goofy, I just love them. Now that we're getting acquainted with Zebus and some of Samus' first abilities, I think it's appropriate to touch over my single biggest... talking point with this game. The controls. It's hard to explain, but this game doesn't really control like any other game in the series. Samus can still do everything she could do in both Metroid 1 and 2, 
but this time around she can also aim diagonally using the shoulder buttons, and she has access to a few new hidden maneuvers, most famously the wall jump. These are all fantastic options to have, and having such an advanced moveset is part of the reason why I think the first two games are so hard to go back to. New to the series, and so far only appearing in this game, is the run button. Every other game in the series has Samus run at a static speed using only the D-pad, but this game gives more options for the player to control their speed, and running is even mandatory in certain areas with collapsing floor tiles like the Noob Bridge, for example. It's cool that this game gives more options for the player in this way, and it becomes second nature to hold the run button once you get used to it being there. But was it really even needed in the first place? I can't ever think of a time where I wouldn't want to be running. It's significantly faster than the default speed and there's no advantage to just jogging slowly. With three face buttons to worry about, there isn't really a comfortable way to be able to run, jump, and shoot all at a moment's notice. So either your thumb is going to be moving around a lot, or you're going to have to whip out the old claw technique. Compare this to other games in the series where there are only two buttons to worry about for shooting and jumping, and you can see that I'm able to rest my thumb over both the buttons and press either one at a moment's notice. To me, the run button just comes off as unnecessary, and only serves to overcomplicate the controls. I'm also not really a fan of how weapon selection works in this game. Similarly to the first two games, you have to press select in order to switch to missiles, which on its own is fine, but now there are four additional options to choose from when you unlock them, meaning you have to keep hitting select until you get the specific ability you want. And it's so easy to accidentally go over the thing you actually want to use, making you start the cycle all over again. And why are you able to select power bombs when you're not in Morph Ball? I know there are the hidden techniques like the beam combos and the crystal flash, but to be honest, most players aren't going to use those, so it just serves as an additional hindrance when you're cycling between all the options. I'm probably just spoiled from playing Zero Mission and Fusion first, but those games really did it right in my opinion. It really isn't necessary to have two different buttons for diagonal aiming, but one does the job just fine, and I would rather have that extra shoulder button be open for using missiles and power bombs. The game gives the option to edit your controls from within the save file settings, but my issue isn't with the layout. No, everything I just said are all things that can't be changed or fixed, sadly. Except for cycling weapons with select, that's really dumb, I always change that to Y. So yeah, I'm not a fan of the controls in this game, and I'd say that overall it's my biggest issue with it. You do get used to them after a while, especially if you've played this game as many times as I have, but let's just say that I'm thankful that later games have learned from this one's mistakes. It's definitely a personal subject, and I know that there are a lot of people that actually prefer this control scheme over the later games, you know, because of the additional freedom given by the run button and Samus's handling in general, but I would rather have slightly more limited options in exchange for more fluid controls. Man, now that I got that out of the way, I hope I can make it through the rest of the video without ruining my credibility. I, I like this game, I swear. Once we get out of the wreckage for Old Torian, we're able to use our new abilities to explore some of the blocked rooms we saw earlier. Using missiles, we can find the game's first map room. Super Metroid is the first game in the series to feature an in-game map, and it's certainly a very welcome change. The map computer reveals most of the main path for the current area, and certain secret areas are still left for the player to discover on their own. It highlights save rooms, recharge rooms, boss arenas, and even marks collectible items, although it doesn't seem to differentiate between items you have and haven't collected. Another little quirk is that it doesn't show doorways between rooms, which can be pretty annoying. But overall, the map is pretty much as informative as it needs to be, and it's helpful enough that I don't think a guide is even necessary this time around. The map gives us a bit of a clue on where to go next, and going through this conveniently Morph Ball sized tunnel, we get the bombs, and the game's first mini boss. The bomb chorizo isn't very difficult, but it is a bit of a surprise when you first see it, so I'm sorry if I just spoiled this nearly 30 year old game for you. Bomb Chorizo basically signifies the end of this first section of the game, and it's after this where we get to move on to greener pastures. Wow, uh, are we sure this is the same Brinstar from the first game? The environments here are so lush and lively, and I love this funky theme that's playing. It's so different from the adventurous tune from Metroid 1, but it gets me just as excited to look around. There's so much variety, from the blue caves that we saw earlier, to these green, overgrown vines, to these pink areas overridden with spores and flower petals, and then finally this red chasm with this swampy kind of soil material. While Metroid 1 did have a lot of these colors as well, almost every room had the same tile sets just with the palette swap. Super Metroid's areas look distinct, and no two rooms share identical layouts with each other, even all throughout the game. Uh, fun fact, this first pink area is also where I quit the game when I played it for the first time as a little kid. Yeah, I never thought to just, you know, go up here. And I just couldn't find Spore Spawn for whatever reason, so I could never figure out how to open the green door. 
I have no idea why. I was able to get through zero missions just fine. I guess I just had a lot less patience back then. The first part of Brinstar is where we get to see some of the new items that this game introduces. New to the series are super missiles, which do three times the damage of a normal missile, and they can open these green doors that I had so much trouble with. The charge beam is also found here, which, get this, lets you charge your beam to do more damage. You can also jump into the enemies when you're fully charged, a technique called a pseudo screw attack, but personally I never really found much use for it. It's also here where the game opens up considerably. I mentioned the wall jump earlier, but this is the first area where you can really use it to its fullest potential. The wall jump is tricky to pull off, but mastering it gives you access to so many sequence breaks and shortcuts all throughout the game. I briefly mentioned in my Metroid 1 review that I really enjoy when games allow for sequence breaking in this way, and no game does it better than Super Metroid. They didn't have to make the game this open-ended, and I'm positive that most of the easier sequence breaks were caught during playtesting, but they chose to leave them in anyway. It's a testament to how mature and respectful the developers were to their players, that they can trust them to get these abilities out of order and then forge their own path through the game. To this day, I don't think I've ever completed Super Metroid without sequence breaking a major item in some capacity. That's how integral I feel it is to the core experience of the game. The first main boss appears not too long after this. You can make a brief trip through Norfair and get the high jump boots to gain access to this entrance, or you could just... not. And there's not much else to do in Norfair at this point anyway. Most of these rooms are too hot for Samus to enter at the moment. I never noticed until now, but I love that this room with the mini crate is actually a reference to a similar room in the first game. Wow, uh, and I thought Ridley got a pretty substantial size increase. Crate is absolutely massive, but he is no sweat. He goes down in just a few super missiles, and beating him grants the Varia suit. Unlike previous games where the Varia suit was an optional item that just boosted defense, here it also prevents heat damage in Norfair, which opens up those extra pathways that we saw earlier. Next up we'll need to find another new upgrade, the Speed Booster. Running forward for long enough allows Samus to build up speed and charge through the room, demolishing everything in her path. This upgrade is definitely one of the more fun ones, and it even grants access to another hidden ability, the Shine Spark. Crouching down in the middle of a sprint stores all of Samus' kinetic energy and allows her to blast straight up into the air at the cost of some health. Technically, you can also go horizontally and diagonally, but I've never been particularly good at that, so up it is. On your way to find the speed booster, you may come across this room. Across the pit is the wave beam, tantalizing you. Normally you would need to wait until after you found the grapple beam and then come back to swing across the pit, but if you're feeling like a renegade... Whenever I play this game, I will always get the wave beam right before the speed booster. Yeah, it's probably the most famous and easiest sequence break in the game, but hey, it's still a sequence break. Normally after getting the speed booster, you would go here to get the ice beam. Then you would travel all the way back to Brinstar, get the power bombs, come all the way back to Norfair, and then use them in the ice beam room to move on. This is fine for a first playthrough, especially because it lets you backtrack through Brinstar and scoop up some items you may have missed in your first time, but this would probably get really annoying on subsequent playthroughs. Doing the wave beam sequence break instead lets you shoot through this gate, giving access to these power bombs as your first set, and lets you explore the rest of Norfair without needing to go to Brinstar. It makes the flow of the game much better, and it makes it way more fun to replay. Other games might see this as an issue that needs to be fixed, but Super Metroid's trust in the player and their ability to handle the consequences of their decisions is still amazing to see even today. The next mandatory item to pick up at this point is the grapple beam, and guarding the entrance to it is Krokemeyer. He's a pretty unique fight. Instead of damaging him directly, he needs to be pushed backwards into the lava before he pushes you into a wall of spikes at the back of the room. This whole sequence reminds me of the fight against Sluggy the Unshaven from Yoshi's Island. I wonder if this fight was any inspiration for that. Oh, ew, uh, Krokemeyer dies a very gruesome death. So gruesome that he even comes back just to tell you how gruesome it was. The grapple beam is the next new item here, and it's, uh, kind of unremarkable? There aren't really that many places that it can get you that a wall jump couldn't, and even then, it's clunky to control. Oh well, they can't all be winners, I guess. At least you can use it to farm for small enemies more easily. Getting the grapple beam also gives you access to a new optional item, the X-ray scope. This is a pretty useful item for newcomers. It lets players see hidden passages and breakable blocks, and I think it's a worthy addition to Samus' arsenal. This is around the point where the game starts to get a bit more dickish with its secrets and hidden passages, so having this item as an option to fall back to at any time is very welcome. Beyond this door is the entrance to the wrecked ship, a small vessel that had sunken into the Lake of Criteria.
Once again, this place is dark and devoid of life. Well, natural life anyway. The power is completely turned off, meaning that some doors and even the save room are completely disabled. The wrecked ship is haunted by spooky ghosts, and in the heart of it all is Fantoon. He's a bit more of a challenge than everything that's come before, but if you counterintuitively decide to not use super missiles, you should have a pretty easy time against them. Killing Fantoon turns the power back on and lets you explore the rest of the ship. This room in particular can be really annoying because it makes you kill every enemy every time you pass through. But it all leads up to this room, where the Chozo statue ceremoniously delivers Samus to her final new upgrade, the gravity suit. You get to see firsthand the effects of the new suit, as the game drops you into the lake below as soon as you get it. On top of an additional defense boost, it no longer hinders movement while Samus is in the water, and she's going to need it to explore the game's next area. And that's it! You're done with the wrecked ship! It is by far the shortest section in the game, which is a bit of a shame because I like the aesthetic when the place is powered down. A haunted ship full of ghosts isn't something you see every day in the sci-fi genre, so I wish we got to see a bit more of it. Below the lake that housed the wrecked ship lies a deep undersea cave system known as Meridia, and it's the final new area in the game. This is only one of two times that the series really tried for a water-themed aesthetic, and this game certainly took a unique approach. Meridia starts off in this silty grotto, but taking this elevator gives you a sneak peek of the Space Pirates research facility. Whatever you do, do not get stuck in these sand waterfalls, they will make your life hell. If you manage to make it through the Nightmare Zone, you'll come across some familiar green caves. You actually pass through here while in Brinstar on your way to Norfair, but now you finally have the means to explore beyond this glass tube. Meridia, more than any other location in the game, is a complicated mess of rooms and tunnels. Can you seriously tell me you're able to figure out where to go just by looking at this map screen? Rooms loop all over the place and go over and under each other, and there are so many branching paths and one-way hallways that can seriously throw you off course. For example, this tunnel that leads back to the top of the Red Chasm in Brinstar. It's nice to know the shortcut is here, I guess, but it's a one-way door, and Brinstar is a seriously long way from where I need to be. By the way, the place that you're supposed to go is under these hidden breakable blocks in an otherwise inconspicuous room. At least we have the x-ray scope. Inside the Space Pirate Labs we see... Metroids that they bought off Wish? Yeah, these are known as Mock Droids, and they're the Space Pirate's failed attempts at creating clones of the last Metroid. The game's been doing a great job of telling the story through subtext up until this point, but I feel like the Mock Droids are the one thing in the game that aren't conveyed well on their own. The boss of Meridia is Dragon. Behavior-wise, he's a really simple boss all things considered, but he can be one of the most difficult. He'll either swoop down for a quick hit, or fire these snot bubbles that let him grab you and deal several energy tanks worth of damage. Fortunately, there are a ton of exploits that are able to take him down quickly. Most famously, these turrets can be destroyed with missiles, and if you let Dragon grab you, you can grapple onto the exposed electricity for a super quick kill. Doing this method brings Dragon from one of the hardest bosses to probably the easiest, but I love that this is even programmed in as an option. It just shows how creative the dev team was. Defeating Dragon grants access to the Space Jump, returning from Metroid 2. This is actually one of three power-ups in all of Meridia, the other two being the Plasma Beam and... the Spring Ball. Okay, this has to be a troll, right? Samus' power scaling slows down quite considerably into the late game, similar to the first two games, but honestly the Plasma Beam alone is enough to make me happy with the loot here. I know that I'm going to need it for the game's greatest challenge. At the very bottom of the entire map lies the penultimate objective, the entrance to the Lower Norfair, Ridley's Lair. Whereas Upper Norfair and Meridia were these interconnected, complex mazes, Lower Norfair is essentially a straight gauntlet to Ridley's chamber. And it is hard. It begins with a fight against another Teresa statue, but this time it's powered up to your level. It sails over your head and can even catch your missiles and throw them back at you. Beating the Golden Teresa grants a screw attack, and never before has it been so useful. Every enemy deals tons of damage and the screw attack is your best bet for taking them out, unless you feel like unloading several super missiles per enemy. It's also here you encounter the strongest variant of the Space Pirates, who suddenly become martial arts experts, and are only vulnerable for a short time after using their strongest attack. I just love the oppressive atmosphere of this place. The music, visuals, and difficulty make this my favorite area in the game. Several power bombs are needed to explore these narrow tunnels, really sending the impression that you're not supposed to be here. But eventually, you step foot in this final chamber, and a familiar set of eyes greet you at the bottom. Ridley is by far the most difficult boss in the entire game, and honestly, I think this might be the hardest Ridley fight in the whole series. He has so much health, so many attacks, so much maneuverability, I consider him to be the true final boss here. 
Every time I've ever fought him, I always come out with just a sliver of health. That's partially due to the fact that he is genuinely difficult, but also just at the way that the fight ends. See, in order to beat Ridley, you need to pass a certain damage threshold and let him grab you so that he can explode. It's a cool moment, but like, you don't want to be grabbed by Ridley, so obviously you're going to try to avoid it. But the issue is that if he doesn't grab you, then he doesn't die. Avoiding him just makes it more likely that he'll hit you with his tail or something, so it's pretty likely that he could still kill you even if he already took enough damage to die first. I'm sure there are probably consistent ways to get the Ridley fight over with fairly quickly, but even times where I purposely try to let him grab me when I know for a fact that I did enough damage, it can still be a bit finicky, which is kind of annoying. Regardless, beating Ridley gives you... Oh, uh, this cannot be good. Well, only one place to go from here. Now that all the bosses are dead, we can finally enter the final area of the game. Like I said earlier, Ridley's chamber is dead ass on the complete other side of the entire map from where you need to be, so the game gives you one last chance to explore anywhere you might not have been yet, or to get any of the lingering upgrades that are left. I have to say, Super Metroid is probably my favorite game in the series to finish with 100% items. It's actually pretty easy to get most of the items as you're going through the game, and it isn't too egregious with making you backtrack right at the very end to get a ton of things. This is admittedly an issue with some of the later Metroid games, so I'm gonna enjoy this while I can. Pretty much the only areas I haven't been in yet are still in Brinstar, so this actually gives me a pretty easy route back to Torian. Along the way, I even met some of these friendly creatures that teach some of the game's more advanced mechanics like the wall jump and the shine spark. You can actually meet the funny ostrich as soon as you get the speed booster, and the funny monkeys as soon as you get the power bombs. Again, I love this in-universe storytelling, and it's great that the game actually tries to teach the players about its more advanced mechanics. Well, we made it. This is the entrance to Torian, the final area of the game. No, not that Torian. It's totally different this time, I swear. It seems like the Mock Troid experiment worked out in the end, because we're finally going up against the real deal once again. Due to Samus's improved strength and maneuverability, the Metroids are easier than they've ever been up to this point. Damn it, I was really looking forward to that third Terezo boss. Deeper into Torian, the environment and enemies all seem like they've gotten the life sucked out of it. See? Called it. This is the titular Super Metroid. It's so powerful that it easily dispatches this enemy that Samus couldn't even damage. It turns its attention towards Samus and begins draining the life from her too. But that's when it hits both of you. The Super Metroid is the very same one that imprinted on Samus back on SR388, mutated by the space pirates in this massive abomination. It comes to that realization right in the nick of time and lets Samus continue her mission. The baby. Neutorian means new mother brain. Yeah, she's back too. Fortunately, this chamber is remarkably easier to get through than the NES game, and the diagonal aiming makes Mother Brain herself a complete joke. There's no way that's the end, right? Oh, wow, I stand corrected. In all seriousness, this is where the real fight begins. Just as easily as you were able to take out Mother Brain's jar, Mother Brain's final form is able to take you out. No matter how much firepower you unload into her, there's no stopping her. All you can hope to do is dodge her attacks, but even that's not going to cut it when she brings out her ultimate weapon. Yep, we're boned. I can't even control Samus anymore. Not that she'd even be able to do anything, but just shows how completely and utterly outmatched she is here. Right when all hope seems lost, the baby Metroid swoops in to protect its mother and takes the brunt of Mother Brain's attack, absorbing her energy in the process. The Metroid then starts to heal Samus, still protecting her from the onslaught of attacks, right until the very end. As a parting gift, the Metroid bestows the Hyper Beam upon Samus, giving Mother Brain a taste of her own medicine. And a worthy sacrifice it was, Mother Brain doesn't even stand a chance against Samus at this point. This fight was never difficult at any point, which is why I considered Ridley to be the true final boss. No, this sequence was more or less meant to be an emotional spectacle for the player, while Ridley was the true test of the player's mechanical skill and knowledge of the game. Even though Mother Brain is more of a cutscene than an actual fight, she still has to be one of the best final bosses in any game. It's the perfect climax for such a beautiful yet simple relationship between Samus and the Metroid. But we're not done yet. Once again, the place is rigged to blow with the defeat of Mother Brain, but this time, the entire planet will be caught in the blast. Well, damn, consider those stakes raised. Let's get out of here. The new Torian intersects into the same escape chamber from last time, and leads back to the surface to Samus' ship. Along the way, you're able to sneak into the secret room where the same animals that taught you those techniques are hiding amongst the chaos. You can actually rescue them by shooting the back wall here, and doing so gives you the best ending to the game. 
See that teeny tiny little pixel flying off into space? You did that, champ. Congratulations. Also, if you don't save the animals, you will go to hell no matter what. Sorry, I don't make the rules. It's written right here. Better start saving those animals, buddy. You know, it's kind of funny how little Samus seems to care about this whole situation when it's later revealed that this is actually her home planet. Similarly to the first two games, you receive your final completion time and a different ending depending on how quickly you beat the game. But new to this game is item collection percentage. It still doesn't have any effect on what ending you get, but hey, this is still a nice feature to have for any completionists out there. So that was Super Metroid, and yeah, it's alright I guess. No, but really, in a lot of ways this is where the series peaked. Easily the best thing about this game is its map design. The world is laid out in such a cohesive and smart way that pretty much anyone can figure it out without too much trouble. The layout of upgrades is just completely genius due to the freedom provided by the advanced techniques that were added. I barely even touched on the music and sound design, and yeah, it's my favorite in the series in that aspect. Every song fits this area perfectly, and every sound has a perfect crunchy ring to it, especially the ice beam. Oh, so good. Every issue I have with this game isn't even really that bad in the grand scheme of things, they're mostly just things that I think other games in the series were able to improve on after learning from this game. Like I said, as much as I didn't really like the controls, I was able to get used to them perfectly fine. I would have preferred the map to be just a little bit more informative, but hey, it gets the job done. A lot of the new power-ups were pretty underwhelming as well, like, I don't think I even mentioned the reserve tanks at all. They exist. There you go. But this was also the game that gave us the speed booster and the gravity suit, so who cares if there were a couple lame power-ups? Even today, it's still so rare for a game to be as well thought out as this one is. The fact that most of my biggest issues with this game are just personal preferences is a testament to that. There's no denying that Super Metroid, all things considered, easily deserves its title as one of the best games ever made. Super Metroid would actually be the last game released in the series for over 8 years, but in 2002, the Metroid franchise's single longest content drought would finally come to an end. Next time, we're going to take a look at Metroid Fusion and see if it's a worthy follow-up to the game that helped define an entire genre. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it, it'll be out a week after this video. If you like this video and want to see more reviews like this in the future, please leave a like and a comment. If you didn't like it, then, I don't know, leave a dislike. I don't even know why you watched this whole long ass video, but more power to ya. Either way, I hope I'll see you next week for Metroid Fusion. Peace out!